We want to welcome those that are viewing in either by DVD, our website, uh, maybe even Facebook today. We're so glad that you took the time to join in with us at Touching Hearts Ministries. Uh, I thank our congregation for coming out today. There's a lot of places you could be today. It's about 80 degrees outside. It's a beautiful day. But you decide to come and worship with us at the Touching Hearts Ministries Church. So as always, before we go any further, we're going to have a word of prayer. That Ask God to come and join us today. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the privilege and the honor of preaching the lovely Jesus Christ to your people. I pray today that whoever is viewing in and in our congregation as well, if they are suffering from low self-esteem, would you touch them today? Let them know just how valuable they are in the sight of God. So valuable that he sent Jesus Christ to come and die for them. Why? Because he loves you. So, Father, be with this message. Touch it. Magnify it through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. So those that are viewing in, I always tell my people, grab a pencil and a pad, write these scriptures down. And after the sermon, you go back through these scriptures and study them for yourselves that you might find out is is Donnie, uh, is he on the mark? Is he on the target today as we study these scriptures? Now, it's called wake up, get up and <laughs> giddy up. <laughs> wake up first, get up. And then giddy up for Jesus Christ. And I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles today in Matthew 26 chapter verses 40. And I want you to read that with me. Matthew 26 40. Here, here's what the Bible says. And he cometh unto his disciples. We're talking about Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus Christ cometh unto his disciples and he findeth them asleep. And said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me just an hour? Jesus Christ was under a heavy burden here. The pressures of the whole world. The responsibility of the world. The sins of the world were on Jesus Christ's back. And all that he asked out of his disciples, If you'll just pray with me for an hour. I've never asked you, <laughs> he was saying, to ever do anything for me. I've always tried to do for you, but this one time, through this one experience, I'm asking you, please, as my brothers, please pray for me. I need your help. Now, Jesus had taken Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him into the Garden of Gethsemane. The sins of the world were weighing heavy on Jesus Christ's shoulders. Why? The fate of the world was in the balance. <laughs> the fate of the world was in the balance. And all the demons of hell, I can guarantee you, Carolyn, were in that garden trying to discourage Jesus Christ from going to the cross. And the cross is our only salvation. Let's go a little bit further. Turn in your Bibles again. Uh, chapter 26 in Matthew, verses 32. I want you to read these scriptures with me. You need to hear the words that you're reading. Matthew 26, 32. And here's what the Bible says. Listen very carefully. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. The crushing weight of the sins of the world were upon Jesus Christ and it was crushing him physically and mentally and emotionally. Not spiritually, but physically, emotionally, it was crushing the life out of Christ. Now, Jesus said unto his disciples, now listen carefully, come and watch with me. I may need your prayers. <laughs> I don't know about you all, but I need the prayers of the saints. <laughs> right, Kathy, Carolyn, Libby? I need the prayers of the saints in my everyday walk and in my faith. I need encouragement. I need prayed for as well. And Jesus said, oh, please come and watch with me. I might need your prayers. I may need to lean upon you physically and emotionally. And I went on to say this again. I have never asked you to do anything, but tonight I need you. And what happened to the disciples? We come to find out as we read scripture, they fell asleep. <laughs> Darren, Darren, when 
Jesus needed them. They fell asleep. Now, who was behind that? The devil? I would say that the disciples were apprehensive. They were looking forward. What is Jesus doing here? And when they went into the garden, I bet they were energetic. They were alive. They couldn't wait to see what was going to happen here. And they sat down and the old devil came and gave them a volume or something. I don't want to give them, but they went fast asleep. There are times, though, when I get off work in the evenings and Brenda as well. We run a daycare as well as our ministry. That time we sat down at eight o'clock on the couch at night. It's all I can do to stay awake. <laughs> I am so sleepy, Amber. It's all I can do. I believe that. The disciples went into the garden and they sat down. Maybe they'd had a long day, Brenda. I don't know. But they were so sleepy. They may have fought it for a few minutes, Rob, but then they went fast asleep. So Jesus really needed them. You know what? That shows us today as a Christian, as being part of God and his church and the unity of the church, we need each other. <laughs> we desperately need each other and the prayers as well. The Bible says here that Jesus left the disciples, walked on a little further, and he fell on his face and said, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, God, but yours. Now, listen, Jesus went back to the disciples three times. And every time he went back, they were asleep. He said, Hey, wake up. <laughs> I need your prayers. I need your help. And on the third time that Jesus Christ went back to check on his disciples, they were fast asleep. And he said, you know what? Go ahead and sleep. Just go ahead and sleep. It's too late. The time has passed. The only one that's going to get through me through this now is God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said amen to that. Now, let's go a bit further here. We are living in the last hour of earth's history. When Christ comes, my question to you today, will we be like the disciples? Will God find us sleeping when he comes back? <laughs> will he? Will we be spiritually asleep when Jesus Christ comes back to claim his church? Now, listen, we must lay aside. I wrote this down here, Brenda. I didn't want to forget this part. We must lay aside the temporal plans of this life with its selfish desires and grasp the magnitude of the hour. It's amazing, Libby, how in this life we will fight and scratch and work and worry about this and that, all about temporal life that's going to pass away, but we don't give eternal life a second thought. <laughs> we find ourselves sleeping when it comes to the eternal things of Jesus Christ. Let's go a bit further. Now, Many who are sleeping should wake up. Many who are still toying with the trivialities of this life, please wake up. God says, oh, my people, seek me. Seek me. Intensify that search. Listen, why? Why do we need to intensify and wake up? God needs us to preach the gospel, to teach the gospel, and to live the gospel. If I'm going to preach the gospel and teach the gospel and live the gospel, I have to be awake, <laughs> not spiritually asleep in the pew. Listen, I need trumpets, God says, through which to sound, vessels in which to flow into the hearts of others. In the name of my son, please wake up, because if you are asleep, I'm speaking with you and to you but you do not hear me. Every time Christ went back to the disciples, I can guarantee you this. He spoke to them, but they were asleep. <laughs> Our grandbabies, when they spend the night, once they go to bed and they are asleep, they know nothing. You can go in and turn the TV on, open doors, turn the lights on, talk to them they don't know anything they are out they are asleep and i'm afraid that jesus christ has spoke to many of people's hearts and because they are spiritually asleep they just don't hear i believe he's even shaking them they are spiritually dead to the word of god because we are so exhausted 
for living in and through the world. We just don't hear him. We, we go fast asleep. It's just that simple. God needs somebody, a trumpet. What's a trumpet? Your voice, <laughs> your talents, your time, your efforts. God needs that because as we studied in our Sabbath school today, Carolyn, God speaks to us through prophets and preachers and teachers and singers and musicians. He speaks to people to get the word out across the world before his soon return. Now, listen, lo, the world is both at the same time on the precipice of destruction, yet on the brink of revival. Know the day in which you live, the Bible says. Listen intently for my voice. Wake up, for the day is at hand. Well, you're Donnie, you're saying, how could the world be at the same time on the precipice of destruction and yet revival? Most of the world today doesn't give a snap about God's word. They don't give God's word a second thought. And yet, Across the world, through ministries like 3ABN, we are reaching thousands in Russia and India and all across the world that are being baptized, Karen, by the thousands. We've watched it on television. You have a group of people, a very small group, that are, listen, that are accepting Christ into their lives. They are wide awake. They are listening. They are looking for something better. Better than the life that they have. They are looking toward heaven. And yet you've got most of the world today that's fast asleep. So what's that mean? The world is coming to the end. Uh, as Pastor John Loman Cain said, we are stepping through this porthole into eternity. And that next step could come at any second. Either you're going to pass away, your heart's going to stop beating, or Jesus Christ is going to come. And you say, well, Donnie, aren't there different events that's going to happen before Jesus Christ comes? I'm afraid that we've been so asleep, they've happened and we don't know it. <laughs> that's the point. He's saying to his disciples, you're fast asleep. I'm talking to you. I'm begging you and pleading you, but you are fast asleep. And the precipice of eternity is coming about. Now, listen, Donnie, I put a question here. I may be spiritually asleep. Jesus may have visited. Jesus may have called my name, but I was asleep. But now my eyes are open. What do I do now? You get up. <laughs> if Christ is awakening you today, those that are viewing in today, and you have been one of those that have taken up room on the pew, a place, a good place to take a nap, and you've taken up room, God is saying to you today, wake up and then get up. What does get up mean? It means to go out into the harvest. You get out there in those fields and you get to work. I need laborers, but the laborers are few. And I'm asking you to wake up now. Get up with whatever talent I've given you. I want you to use that to benefit the church and bring souls into the kingdom before my soon return. So the first thing we have to do today is wake up. Listen for God's instruction. And once you get the instruction, then get up, <laughs> get to work. And I put this down, and this is the truth. Brenda and I have traveled across America into over 100 cities. And in 20 states, we've been in Africa and Indian all across America as well. Here's what we have found that's going on in God's church today. Listen, in every church, whether they have 100 or they have 25,000, there are just a handful of workers. The others are taking up room. The others are asleep. They are those that organize. You have just a handful. Carolyn, you know what I'm talking about. Robbie, Susan, in every church, there's just a handful. And these folks, these workers, they woke up and then they got up. These folks, they arrange potlucks. They pass out literature. They call members. They put up bulletins. They visit the sick. They send out cards of invitation. And they clean the church. There's just a handful in every church. Let's go. Before. And as you go and visit these church and you preach in them and you evangelize, evangelize, you pick up really quick who are the workers and who are the sleepers. <laughs> really quick. Let's go a bit further here. Now, then as the fine on lesson, I, I, I guess I'm going to make it more clear. There are those that take up room on the pews. 
And for all appearances, they are spiritually asleep just as the sermon begins. They pass out. That's what they do. They, they out of habit. 90% of what we do in everyday life is habit. How you react, how you talk, what you eat, where you go, what you do. 90%, they did a survey, is out of habit. So out of habit, after years of practice, as the sermon begins, they go to sleep. That's exactly what goes on. I've seen it. Now, then, then, I'm not finished. Those that went to sleep. Then, as the final hymn is sung, they wake up out of their sleep and they look around to see where they're at. And they discover they're in church. I'm telling it like it is today. I have preached in many a church and look at the back. Someone has fell backwards asleep and the slobber is coming down. It's coming down their face because they fell fast asleep. But as the piano starts on the last hymn, they come up out of their sleep and they get up and go out the back door. Is everybody with me so far? Might as well tell it like it is today. Now, let's go a bit further. Remember earlier when we said that our Lord spoke and said, I need trumpets through which to sound the warning. Be ready, wake up, and then get up. Here's what it says in Acts 26, 14. Get your Bibles out. Those that are viewing in, I'm speaking to you as well today. Listen very, very carefully. Acts 26, 14. And when, we, <laughs> when he had fallen to the earth, Paul says, I heard a voice speaking to me and say, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And 26, 15 says, and he said, who are you? Paul said he heard a voice. He'd been knocked off of his horse and he became blind. And he said, who is this voice that's speaking to me? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And here's what I put right here, Susan. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, Paul was spiritually deaf. <laughs> Listen, he was spiritually deaf, spiritually blind. And in the twinkling of an eye, he woke up. That's what happens in conversion. And here's what I like about Paul, Amber. I love it. The first thing he said, what would you have me do? When he woke up, he got up. Many, many people, they hear the message, and they wake up, and then they go back to sleep like the disciples did. They fall right back to sleep. They don't say, oh, Jesus, what do you want me to do? They go back to sleep. Let's go a bit further here. Now, here's what it says in Romans 13, 12. Romans 13, 12. The night, Paul said, is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness, and then let us put on the whole armor of God. Now, at Touching Hearts Ministry, what we try to do in our messages, there are Folks out there that have just awakened. I call them newborn babies. They just woke up. Now, we try to preach the gospel of Christ. A little prophecy, a little doctrine. But we don't want to take it too much meat and try to give it to them at once. Are you with me so far? Let me give you a perfect example of that. Those that just wake up are what I call newborn babies. Now. Ben's, I had the opportunity of working in hospitals for 33 years. I know this. A baby is born in what they call the delivery room. They take that baby and they carry the baby to the nursery. When they get the baby to the nursery, the nurse does not fry up a vegetarian burger and try to feed the baby. Are you with me? <laughs> what do they feed the baby? Milk. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, says, We start our new babies, though that just woke up, we give them the milk of the Word. We don't try to cram all that meat of prophecy and doctrine all at once. We give them milk. Donnie, when the nurse puts the baby in the nursery, why don't they give them a veggie burger? Because they're not mature enough and they'll choke to death. It's too much. They don't have any teeth, right? So, you give them milk. 
And for a period of time, the baby starts to mature. And as the baby matures, we give them baby food. And you say, why? How do you know they need baby food? They start to cry out. I'm no longer satisfied with milk. I need something with some substance. Are you with me? So we give the baby baby food. As the baby matures, it starts to cry out again. Why? Because the baby food is not satisfying the baby's hunger. So we start to feed the baby solid food. Are you see where I'm going here? And as the baby matures and the baby grows up, that baby has a baby. And then that baby feeds that other baby milk and then baby food. And then the, is everybody with me so far? We have new members that are coming into the Adventist church today. We, we need to gently give them milk, Jesus Christ first. Introduce Christ. And as they learn of him, they become hungry. And we give them even more substance, something more solid. And then before it's over, they're crying out, Okay, I know about Jesus. I know about the law. Now, I want to learn prophecy. Is everybody with me? What we said a few weeks ago, that doctrine teaches the Word of God. Prophecy proves, but Jesus Christ transforms the heart. Is everybody with me so far? All right, let's go a little bit further. Now, okay, they just woke up, newborn babies, give them the milk, and as they mature in their walk with Jesus, we start to feed them the meat of the Word that it talks about in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Now, verse 16, 26, 16 in Acts. Here's what the Bible says. Listen, but arise. In other words, okay, you've heard the word. Now, you woke up. Now, get up. But arise and stand upon thy feet. For I appeared unto thee for this purpose. He's talking to Paul. This is Jesus. To make you a minister and a witness. Both of the things which you've seen and those things that I will appear to you, I will give to you as we go further in your walk with me. Now, Paul said, what do you want me to do? I want you to deliver the people. I want you to take the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? We are. <laughs> Darren, you're a Gentile. <laughs> We're not of the Jewish persuasion. We're Gentiles. So the Word of God doesn't just go to a specific people. God wants everybody in the kingdom, not willing that any should perish. He sent Jesus Christ. So the word of God that we are to give after we wake up and get up goes to the whole world. Praise God, whether you're black, white, Russian, Indian, whatever it might be. God loves you all exactly the same. Now, and listen to this. After Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he taught many, many disciples after his death. But as he resurrected and ascended up into heaven, Look what happened. You'll find that in Acts 1, 10, 11. Here's what the Bible says. And while they steadfastly looked toward heaven. It's talking about the disciples. After Jesus had resurrected from the dead, he spent time with them, Carolyn. <laughs> we know he did in the upper room and in different places as well. And all of a sudden, Christ said, it's time for me to go back home to heaven. And as he ascended, the disciples were standing there and they kept looking, looking. And looking as he went up and out of sight. And as he stood there, behold, two angels came. And they said, Ye men of Galilee, why are you standing and gazing up into heavens? It's time to giddy up now. Praise God. They had woke up. They had accepted Christ. They had gotten up. Now Christ was gone. And they said, Now it's like a horse. Giddy up. What does a horse do when you say giddy up? He moves forward, doesn't he? Most of mine threw me off. Most horses move forward when you say, giddy up. That's what the Bible says. And that's what Christ is saying here. You woke up, you were dead asleep, you got up, and now you need to go into the giddy up state. Everyone that is born again of God needs to be continually in the giddy up stage. There is no stopping. We did a sermon here a few months ago called Paddling Upstream. And in the sermon we said that the Word of God is a paddle. And that as we go upstream, why are we going upstream? Because we're fighting the world's thoughts and philosophies and ideals and the devil. And so as we paddle upstream for Jesus, what do we use? We use the paddle. What's the paddle? It's the Word of God. And we're fighting upstream. We're going up because the current, Robbie Dean, is pushing toward us. The devil is against us. 
powers, principalities in dark places as well. And as we go upstream and we're patterning continually, there we found out in the sermon, there's no stopping point. If we ever stop, what happens? We go right back downstream. <laughs> right back to the old life, Darren, that we lived before. We accepted Christ. So, got to keep moving forward. This here, paddle, the Word of God, is in the giddy-up stage. Here we go. We are moving forward for Jesus Christ. Now, what the angels were saying, men, you have been awakened by the Holy Spirit. Stop staring into space and giddy up and go. That's what the angels were saying. I'm breaking it down to delay the, the day's language. Now, listen. How many times have you prayed? If you want me to do this or that, please open an avenue. Have you ever said that? I have over and over and over again. Lord, if you want me to do this or that, please unlock a door. But how many times did you actually get up to see if the door was even locked or unlocked? We have opportunities come into our everyday life every day. And you know what we do with them? We don't even check them out. <laughs> we let them go. Those opportunities, God said, here's an opportunity. Well, I better not do that. I'm not smart enough. I'm not bright enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough wealth. I don't have enough influence. I better stay out of that. And yet God is giving us the opportunities to wake up, get up, and get up, and take his word to the world. And we keep passing them up. Listen, God will unlock doors. And some of them will stay locked. God knows what is best for us, and he has a plan for us. But we must make the effort to check every door. <laughs> Is that the one God wants me to go through? If he doesn't want you to go through that door, Kathy, it will be locked. If it opens up, I suggest you go through the door. Now, what Blake told me, because I've always been a person that once I start something, I go at it with all the gusto, whether I'm mowing the yard, whatever I might be doing, that I can possibly do. And so what happened, God, Blake told me, he said, Dad, you're in the ministry now. There, you need to check every door. But if it's locked, don't try to pick it. If it's locked, leave it locked. <laughs> and then go to the next door. Because God has a plan for me. It may not be through that door. It might be through that door. Is everybody with me so far? Amber, Libby, are you still with me? They're still there. Praise God. Let's go a bit further. Now, I put this down, what we do in our ministry, what we've done for 14 years. I am continually... My wife will back me up on the phone, speaking with pastors, leaving emails, making brochures, doing all I can to get into the many different churches that we've been in across America. I'm asking God to open the doors to these churches, but I'm also making an effort to get into the churches. When I accepted Christ, I wanted to step into the ministry. I just couldn't stay home and sit by the phone. You have to pick it up. You have to write a letter. You have to text. You have to make the effort. Because it, it, <laughs> I can wish all I want that some church in Alabama will want me to come to them. But if they don't know I'm even there, I probably won't be asked. You have to make yourself known. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> it's making sense to me, but it's making sense to anybody else. I, it really is. Now, if after speaking to the pastors, and mailing my brochures, and doing all that I can, if I'm not invited, or allowed into the churches, then I assume, God has locked the door, never try to force your beliefs on anyone, God never forces his beliefs on you, he presents them, it's up to you to make that decision, don't ever try to force your beliefs on your children, on your wife or your friend. Let them have the opportunity to study for themselves. Amen? Don't say my way is the, it's either my way or the highway. Can't say that. Let them study for themselves. All I'm asking you to do is to live the life of Christ in front of them. Be an example for them. You woke up, get up, get giddy up. If they see you doing this for Christ and in Christ, through Christ, Maybe they'll make that decision. You don't have to force it down their throats. And everybody said, amen to that. Get up, get up, get up, get up. Now, waking up 
means that we have come to the realization that there is a God and that this God is a creator of all things. The next thing we do after waking up is to follow Jesus. Get up! <laughs> Disciples, they all woke up. And when Jesus asked them to follow them, they did. Peter was a fisherman. He said, hey, Peter, come and follow me. What did Peter do? He got up, he woke up, he got up, and he followed Jesus. Amen? Now, example. <laughs> to wake up and get up is a miracle in itself. Before we step into the giddy-up stage, something must take place. Transformation. <laughs> Some people wake up, get up, and go into the giddy-up moment in a matter of just a second. I call that a miracle. Let me give you the miracle. Peter and John walked into a courtyard and there was a gate outside the courtyard and there was a cripple lying there that had been crippled from birth and he would lay there and sit there with a big basket and everybody that came in through this gate because he was crippled he couldn't work crippled since birth he would ask for money he wanted money why to live and everyone that came through he would ask some gave some didn't one day to his Fortune, not misfortune, fortune. Peter and John walked into the courtyard. And he thought, there's a couple guys. I bet they got a couple bucks on them. They may have some gold on them. They may have some silver on them. So he said, hey, here I am over here. Give me some money. And Peter and John looked at him and said, I tell you what, we don't have any money. <laughs> we don't have any gold. We don't have any silver. But we've got something we want to share with you. We want to give it to you. Just look on us. Why? They wanted to, him to see Jesus in them. Look on us. And we're going to uh, give you what we have. Get ready. Open them arms up. It's about to come. And as he looked upon him, Peter prayed, and the man was healed instantly. Now, here's what I like about the story. He didn't just sit there looking around say, what happened? He looked at his legs, and the Bible says that he leaped up. And then he started to run around. And then he went praising God. He ran into the temple with them. This man, he woke up, got up, and giddy up at one moment. We need more of those Christians in our church today. <laughs> we are in desperate need of people that wake up, get up, and start moving for Jesus Christ. Listen to this in Mark 4. Listen to what the Bible says. Mark 4, 36-41. Hope you're writing the scriptures down, those that are viewing in. I want you to review these scriptures after the sermon's over. Mark 4, 36 through 41. While Jesus slept in the boat, a mighty storm came, and the disciples were certain that they were going to die. And they woke up Jesus, who calmly said, Peace, be still. Peter was in the boat. He seen a miracle. Matthew 8, 14 and 15. Peter's mother-in-law was healed of her fever. Peter was there. Matthew 14, 20. Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish, and he fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and there were still 12 baskets left over. Peter was there. Matthew 17, 1 through 7. Listen. Peter saw the transfiguration of Jesus when he met with Moses and Elias. He was there in all of these miracles. And yet there came a time that he ran off and left Jesus for fear of his life. You know what that proof is? Many people say, if I saw the miracles that Jesus did when I was there, I would have been a Christian too. I would have never rejected him. Peter saw all these miracles and fear for his life, he ran. Miracles are not a transforming power. <laughs> They're there for a while and we forget them. Jesus Christ is the one who transforms. When you wake up and giddy up and go into the stage of working for Christ, you have been empowered with the Holy Spirit. Touching Hearts Ministries, 3ABN, 3ABN or Three Angels Broadcasting, those are not my ministry or Danny Shelton's ministry. Those are God's ministries. <laughs> We're nothing more than tools. If you'll ask Danny Shelton about Three Angels Broadcasting, the second largest independent Christian station in the world, if that's his ministry, he says, no, that's God's. I'm not capable of running such a ministry. 
God provides the funds. He provides the miracles. He provides the people. He provides the avenues to reach people. I'm just, I'm just a vessel there for 3 ABN. Praise God. I feel the same way in our ministry. Brendan and I both. We're just here. God called us, said, I want to use prophets and preachers and teachers to take my gospel out to the world. Would you be a part of it? And we looked at each other and said, well, <laughs> we got all kinds of problems. <laughs> we got faults. God said, I love you. It will not be you doing the miracles. I'm going to be doing the miracles of reaching people for my son and through Christ and in Christ. So as we close here today, I want the viewers to know out there in our congregation here as well that Jesus Christ, the son of God, the one that says, wake up, get up and giddy up is intensely in love with you. You don't earn that love. It's a gift. You don't earn eternal life through works. It's just a gift. This God, this Jesus is calling you today to accept him as your personal savior. You say, but Adani, I got faults, shortcomings. I'm weird. It doesn't matter. God loves you and he has a task designed just for you because you will reach somebody out there and bring them into the kingdom that touching hearts cannot reach. No other ministry can reach. God is calling you to reach somebody else for Jesus. So bow before him today. Humbly fall before him. He knows you. Take off that mask. Quit trying to pretend to be somebody else. He knows exactly who you are. And yet, he still loves you. He wants to wash you clean in the blood of Christ and wrap Christ's righteousness around you. And then he wants to empower you to put you into the giddy up stage through the power of the Holy Spirit. James, the second chapter, says that God is no respecter of persons. He loves everybody exactly the same with all of his heart. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, precious Lord and Savior, this message was not meant to offend anyone. It was meant to wake us up. Your soon return is just a breath away. So, Father, in your mercy and grace, wake us up. Fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. Put us into that giddy-up stage of taking Jesus Christ to the world. Guide us, empower us, and direct us, I pray, through my best friend, Jesus Christ. Amen.